fundamental problem we're hoping to be able to uh, understand better is how can we prevent subdural hematomas from coming back? Subdural hematoma is essentially when you get a collection of blood between the dura and the brain. Um, and uh, for the longest time, the only treatment that we've really had was to drain it. Basically, you either make a small craniotomy, two small burr holes, um, or you could do a bedside procedure to potentially um, drain the fluid. Um, and it's an easy enough procedure. It's one of the first things that my residents are gonna learn how to do. Um, but the vexing part is that they tend to come back relatively frequently. Reports in the literature range from 10 to even 30 um, uh, percent recurrence. And it turns out the, the big issue is that these subdurals tend to form membranes. Basically, you have inflammatory cells that come in. Those inflammatory cells um, uh, secrete pro-angiogenic factors that um, cause blood vessels to ingrow from the dura. And those tend to set up this process where you have these leaky vessels, exudates of fluid, and you, the, the thing just never goes away. So the hypothesis was, well, if we could devascularize these membranes, potentially we could uh, dry them up, uh, prevent the, the, this, this cycle from taking place, and reduce the number of times the patient might need surgical intervention. So that's what we did. We designed a trial where we looked at two different patient groups, patients who had larger hematomas who needed surgery, um, and patients who had smaller hematomas, less significant symptoms, who fundamentally didn't need surgery, at least not yet. Um, and then we randomized each of those um, to either get embolization or not. So basically four arms in the trial. The part that we presented here today was uh, the surgical cohort, where we looked at the patients who were either randomized surgery plus embolization or surgery without. Um, and we wanted to understand how frequently did they need to go back to the operating room, uh, secondarily, were we causing them harm by subjecting them to another potentially dangerous procedure? And then, of course, a whole host of um, health economics and other kinds of outcomes that we were looking at. We were excited to find that we had a threefold reduction in the rate of return to operating room in the patients who were treated with embolization as opposed to, to those who were not. Um, and in fact, the finding is probably a little bit more robust than um, even the data suggests because um, in our intent to treat uh, analysis, we had several patients who were treated out of the study, surgery only, and they, when they had a recurrence instead of going to the operating room, the uh, investigators were so enthusiastic about embolization that they embolized them as opposed to taking them to the operating room. So they didn't meet the official endpoint and yet still should have you know, caused that number to be higher in terms of recurrence. And on the other side, we had two patients who were assigned to receive embolization who um, had dangerous uh, vascular variants. They couldn't actually get embolized and they ended up recurring. So that number probably should have been lower. So this is a very robust finding. And putting this in the context of the field, there are um, uh, two other trials that were presented alongside ours at the International Stroke Conference. The STEM trial, which is funded by BALT uh, using a different liquid embolic agent, um, and the Magic MT trial out of China, which again uses the Onyx um, Medtronic uh, liquid embolic. All three of our trials demonstrated the same thing, reduced um, uh, problems if you had embolization. The outcomes were a little bit different. The patient uh, um, demographics were a little bit different, but overall, if you dry up that membrane, patients tend to do better. In our study, that is ongoing. We are continuing with enrollment at this point. Um, the other two trials, interestingly, kind of intermixed them. So they had both surgical and observation patients in each of theirs. Um, and so it's a little bit of a more heterogeneous group, but one of the interesting analyses that uh, Dr. Adam Arthur presented, he was the, one of the PIs of the STEM trial. Uh, although they weren't powered to look separately at surgery versus observation, when they pull out those numbers, the effect size is much greater for the observation, meaning um, they were actually preventing even the first surgery at much higher rates than even we're preventing that second surgery. So we're really excited to be able to see what that observation cohort looks like. Getting close, but these trials always take time. This is a paradigm shift, absolutely. There are three trials that have already been reported um, that you know, obviously we wanna see the final publication when it comes out to be able to assess the nitty gritty. Um, there is a fourth trial, the membrane trial, um, that's chaired by Chris Kellner out of Mount Sinai. Um, they've completed enrollment um, and they are uh, you know, in their follow-up period now. Um, there is another trial in Canada. There's another trial in France. We've got six trials. We su suspect that this is gonna be another 2015 kind of event where 
all the stroke trials came together, all pointing in the same direction. And yes, that created a paradigm shift in how we treat stroke. Now, stroke is an interventional disease. And um, we expect that when all of these data are fully available and um, that everybody can evaluate them, that this is going to create a paradigm shift, that there will be guidelines. I mean, our recommendation is anybody who, who has a subdural ought to be considered for minimal meningeal artery embolization, particularly if they're symptomatic. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're excited to see what all the data show um, in totality. And we have a bunch of different analyses that we're planning once that's available, because for the longest time, we didn't quite know uh, some of the nitty gritties about what constituted um, an adequate embolization, what were some of the finer details. And now we've got 1,500, 2,000 patients that we can bring together into a single um, uh, sort of meta study to be able to look at. So we're really excited about the embolized trial, um, uh, sort of approaching this problem of these middle meningeal artery embolizations. And one of the big uh, things that we found was that it is safe. And the reason that's important is because there are other disease states that we think we might be able to attack through a similar approach. For instance, um, about 13% of the world's population suffers from uh, migraine headaches. That's a billion people. And there are some early data that suggests that at least some subset of those are related to problems with that same artery, the middle meningeal artery. And so potentially if we could go in and either anesthetize it, lidocaine infusions, um, or embolize it, as we've done here, uh, we may be able to uh, reduce the severity or even get rid of the migraines in some of these patients, which could be a huge uh, public health benefit because we know that migraine causes a lot of missed days of work, a lot of pain and suffering, my wife suffers from migraines. I wish I could do this for her, right? I think that um, uh, this is uh, potentially a way of treating any number of other diseases as we sort of push the boundaries.